Hello, my name is Wesley Dunn. I'm the Minister of Discipleship at First Baptist Owensboro. And I want to welcome you back to our study of Proverbs as we are, our Sunday school classes are walking through the Explore the Bible curriculum. Their personal study guides look like this. Lifeway provides these for many churches and we have chosen to utilize this curriculum in our Sunday school classes. And with not being able to meet right now, uh, we are doing these videos as a way for you to continue on in your study of Proverbs. And so we're glad that you're here with us again. If this is your first time, thanks for joining us. We're glad that you're here. If you're interested in knowing more about who we are as a church, you can uh, find out that information at our website, fbcowb.org. And if you're wanting to see more of these videos, you can go to either our website and, and find a link there, or you can go to our YouTube channel by searching for First Baptist Owens World, which you're obviously on. You can just go back and check out our other videos and, and see more of our study of Proverbs and even go back uh, in our last quarter and see many studies through the book of Romans. So as we are uh, continuing on our study today, if you have your Bible, I hope you do, and, and possibly have your personal study guide with you, if you will open up to Proverbs chapter 14. That's where we're going to be today. As we begin, let me uh, open us up in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you again to study your word, to read it, to meditate on it, to, to seek understanding of it in order to have application of it in our lives. Father, we know that in our own wisdom, our own attempt at wisdom, our own thinking and, and what seems right to us, we are oftentimes off the right path. But we know that your word consistently, faithfully steers us in the direction that we need to be going to be faithful to you and be honoring to you and also for the good of others. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we are here to look at Proverbs 14, um, we have now uh, entered into a new section of um, a new section of the book of Proverbs, a little bit different than the one that we've been studying through in chapters one through nine. This lesson is entitled "Living Wisely." Living wisely, and it's. Its theme is that following God's wisdom leads to joy, while failing to do so leads to grief. Now, our context for this is, is chapters 10, uh, t chapter 10, verse 1, through the entire chapter 14. So, four chapters there. I would encourage you to take the time to read at some point, but um, we're going to be looking today at verses 8 through 15 of chapter 14. Now, as we uh, begin looking at this, um, just just so you know the section that we are in, we are in um, a, a section that now, and, and as I talked about this in the last video, uh, we could see in chapter one or chapter ten, verse one, where Solomon's proverbs. He begins. He's gotten out of that uh, that first section where he's trying to persuade or argue his son to follow wisdom and now he actually gets to giving some of that wisdom and he does so in this this area in a form of proverbs and so it's it's the mostly a a collection of short pithy statements or sayings which are easily remembered and uh, memorized and and stated over and over again um, a proverb is, is, is stated in the commentary is a, a well designed for teaching and learning. Uh, they're clear, they're easy to remember. So we're going to get a lot of that in these, these sections. Um, this core passage that we're looking at today, verses 8 through 15, is another example of a subsection. So it's, it's an example of a subsection within the larger section of 10 through 14. So. I'll talk, talk in a moment about why we know this is a subsection, but just know this, that even in the midst of these proverbial sayings, oftentimes we can think, man, these seem so disconnected. What, what's the connection here? Um, there are sections inside the larger grouping that are meant to be read together, and 8 through 15 is one of those. So, But as we begin our time today, um, as we think about wisdom and its impact on yourself and others around you. I'm reminded, and I think this sets the, 
the stage well for what we're studying today. I, I grew up playing a lot of baseball. Some of you may be played as well, or you're familiar with the sport. I think it's one of those sports in our society that people are, are pretty familiar with. Um, I ended up having the opportunity to go on and play uh, in college here in, in Owensboro at a small school here. And when the diamond is set up, whether you're playing in Little League or whether you're playing in college, professional ball, it doesn't matter. There's, when you're on offense and you're batting, there's going to be a first base coach and a third base coach. Now, let's imagine that there's a runner on second base. That third base coach is very helpful for him because when that ball is hit, more than likely it could be in a place where he can't see what's going on. And this is the same thing in softball, he or she. But when that runner is attempting to, to go to third and then maybe go home to score, there's a lot that can't be seen. And so there is a need to rely on the, the vision and the guidance and the wisdom of that third base coach who can see the entire field and can direct that runner to go on home or to stop and hold up. And I've seen it happen many times, as you probably have as well, that that runner on second takes off and the third base coach is giving directions to stop, hold up, and that runner doesn't listen at all. Just blows right by the direction and the wisdom of that coach and heads on home and gets thrown out at the plate. Well, not only is that runner thrown out and it meant to his demise that he, he didn't get to score and his, his team didn't get to run, it not only impacted him, but it impacted the rest of his team who now if that was the third out, they no longer have a chance in that inning to score. And that, they needed those runs in order to stay in the game. You see, can, not listening and not following the direction of the one who can see everything going on, whether or not the ball was bobbled in the outfield, whether or not the, the outfielder took a bad angle and didn't get to it the way they needed to, that person can see all that and can give right direction to the runner. But if you don't listen it's to your demise at home plate and you're out. Listen, that's a game, but in life, we can make the analogy now, we can, we can bridge over that in life, what seems right to us to blow by the third base coach and to do what we think is best, even though we might not see the bigger picture behind us or in front of us or around us, it can lead to our demise and grief. And what we're gonna see is ultimately lead to death. And that wisdom that we're to be following is not a third base coach that can be right sometimes and wrong sometimes. No, it is the wisdom and the direction of the one who is never wrong, God himself. So that's what we're looking at today when we think about wisdom and following the direction, what the outcomes are. That's an important thing to consider. Now, as we approach verses 8 through 15, we've talked about this is a subsection. Why do we know or how do we know that 8 through 15 is meant to be together and there is something being communicated by the author Solomon in this way? Well, what we have in 8 through 15 is a chiasm or a chiastic structure. This is a Hebrew form of writing which is meant to give the focal point and the supporting points in a different format. So what you have is verses 8 and verses 15 both go together and they kind of mirror one another and then verses 9 and verses 14 go together and mirror one another and so that's kind of this this pyramid thing I, I, I drew out this so that you could see it so you can see that verse 8 15 go together verse 9 14 together verse 10 13 go together, which I have A, A, B, B, C, C, all to get to the D ones, verses 11 and 12. Now, as you can see, all these funnel down, so moving forward, moving backwards, it wouldn't be helpful just to move forward in verse and go chronologically 8, 9, 10, 11 in our study. It's better to look at 8 and 15 together, 9 and 14, 10 and 13, and 11 and 12 because they mirror and complement one another ultimately pointing us to the main point of the passage, which is verses 11 and 12. That's what Solomon wants us to see. That's 
the main trajectory, main argument in this subsection that he wants to communicate. So we want to see that structure and understand that in all this reading it may seem a little discombobulated. It's not. It's, it has a purpose in its structure. And that's what we have here. So what I want to do for you is read verses 8 through 15 in order, and then we'll go back and study them. So let's look at this. Verse 8. The sensible person's wisdom is to consider his ways, but the stupidity of fools deceives them. Fools mock at making reparation, but there is goodwill among the upright. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. Even in laughter a heart may be sad, and joy may end in grief. The disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves, and a good one what his deeds deserve. The inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible one watches his steps. Notice that in verse 8 and 15 we see those bookends of the sensible person being talked about but they're in reverse order. Do you notice that? Verse 8, the sensible person is talked about first. In verse 15, the sensible person is talked about last because of that chiastic structure where it is, it is going out to that point and coming back. And so it's just flipped in reverse. The order of the verses is flipped uh, in order to point towards that main thing he wants to communicate. So what is the main thing that that Solomon wants to communicate, it's in verses 11 and 12, that the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. Ultimately, what he's saying is, there's a foundation that we can have, verses 11 and 12, and I don't want to get in too deep into explaining this because I'm going to get to it in a little bit uh, and remind you of it, but the house of the wicked will be destroyed. So, you can have a house, but if its foundation is wickedness, it can be destroyed. But a person can have a tent, but as long as the foundation is strong, it will flourish and won't have anything to worry about. A house versus a tent. What matters is the foundation. And Solomon's saying, listen, if your foundation, in verse 12, he goes on to explain a little bit more. If your foundation is yourself, if that's the root system you have, if that's what you're depending on, if, that, if, that's, what, if that's who you're trusting in is in yourself, or other men, or their way of thinking, instead of God's wisdom, what's the result? Death. Death. So, that's the main point he wants to get across. But he uses these others to communicate some important things that lead up to that. So, the first one that's talked about is how a person should be prudent. Verses 8 and 15. How a person should be prudent. So let's look at 8 again. The sensible person's wisdom is to consider his way but the stupidity of fools deceives them. In verse 15, the inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible one watches his steps. So, the sensible person mentioned here is prudent. They are wise. They consider with great detail the next steps they're going to take. They don't do just what feels good or what they think might be right. They go get wisdom. They are prudent. They are listening and considering what should be done. But, the fool or the inexperienced one, they'll believe anything that's told to them. They'll do whatever feels right. Their own stupidity actually deceives them because it feels right or, or seems right to them, but it's not. And so wisdom should be, come in, in prudence, and we should look to something beyond ourselves for right understanding and right application in life. And we know that is godly wisdom and those around us who would give godly wisdom. So, within this situation, or within this section, we see that there should be prudence in the life of a wise person. But then when we look at 9 and 14, there's also in this wisdom contentment to be found. So, verse 9, fools mock at making reparation, but there is goodwill among the upright. In verse 14, the disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves and a good one what his deeds deserve. So here we have 9 and 14 together, and Solomon emphasized that foolishness leads to discontentment, while wise living leads to contentment. Now when we look at this, and we're looking at this, this section, um, 
there is a, a word here that maybe we need to talk about, fools mock at making reparation. Well, what's being talked about here? Well, uh, for God's people in the days of Solomon, the law couldn't have been clearer regarding the need to make restitution for sin. So we, he had to present a guilt or trespass offering to a priest if someone had sinned against another person. So if you sinned against another person in the days of Solomon, the law that God had given meant that you had to pay them back. And in fact, I'm pretty sure as I, I did my studying, it resulted in them needing to pay back uh, an additional 20% um, beyond what the damages might have been and how they, or what was considered to be the damages. And then also an offering had to be offered before the priest um, to make restitution for that sin. And so what is, what is being said here is fools mock it having to do that. They say, I'm not giving away my own wealth to somebody. Yeah, I may have hurt him. It doesn't matter. He, he's saying fools mock it at doing that, but there is goodwill among the upright. Those who do it, there will be goodwill among them, not only vertically, but horizontally in the relationships with another, one another when things are made right. And in verse 14, the disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves and a good one what his deeds deserve. Now, we might hear that and start thinking, oh man, um, what does this mean? Is this talking about, um, can, can someone actually be a good person? Um, and is this a, you know, we can earn our favor before God? That's not what's being communicated. Uh, the good one can expect a different outcome than, than the disloyal one. This verse doesn't suggest, though, that people can become good by their own efforts. Listen, we know through New Testament things and even in the Psalms, no one is good, not even one. Um, no one is righteous. No one is good. That's, that's what we understand from the Scripture. So goodness comes from the Lord. Their walk with Him produces goodness in them that shows in their actions. And ultimately, this promise here that we have doesn't imply that being good will earn God's favor. Instead, it assures us that living out God's wisdom brings the true reward of lasting contentment. So when the Lord changes us, and we are able then to do good, and others recognize that, and we live in a situation where we have good relationships with others because of the actions we're living out, we can have contentment through wisdom. But the disloyal one, the one who doesn't live with uh, wisdom but instead is foolish and disloyal, um, he'll get what his conduct deserves. So if he wrongs others, it's going to end up, he's going to get wronged as well. And if we look at um, verse 9, um, if they are unwilling to pay back what they need to pay back for the damages they caused, then they're going to end up getting paid back damages as well and not be taken care of. And so we see that in, in the wisdom, there is prudence that should be lived out. There is contentment to be found. And when I think about this, um, just in this section, I want to want to pause for a moment and say once again that there is nothing we can do, even using the wisdom of this book, to have good common sense and just be good moral people. You can you can do some good things if you follow what's here, but you will not have a true transformation until you submit your life to Christ and say, I'm going to listen to your word. I'm going to follow everything you say. I'm going to submit to you. And that's what Solomon's getting at when he ends up saying there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. You can even take some of the things out of this book and put them into practice, quote unquote, but if you're doing it with your own motivations toward getting your own gain, that can seem right to you, but ultimately its way and the end of it is death. If we're not doing these quote-unquote good things and listening to this wisdom out of a submission to Christ and His Lordship, then we're going to be coming at it from the wrong motivations, and it'll, be, it'll lead to death. And so I want to encourage you to discern in your own life. Do, am I wanting to listen to Proverbs for my own gain or for the glory of God and the good of others? That's a great question to ask as we're here in the middle of our Proverbs study. But so far we see that there is prudence to be found in wisdom, there is contentment to be found in wisdom, and then there is joy to be found. There, there is a joyfulness that comes in being one who follows the wisdom of God 
versus the foolishness of the world. And if we look at that, we can see in verses 10 and 13, this talked about, it says, The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. And then if we look at verse 13, it says, Even in laughter a heart may be sad, and joy may end in grief. Solomon declared that the person who appears to be happy may actually be bitter, knowing that laughter isn't the same thing as joy. There's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness can come from, depending upon circumstances, joy is a decision that is made. Joy comes in following Christ and that decision to follow Him and that no matter what happens, I can have that joy from Him that circumstances may end up bad, but there is joy to be found in living for Him, knowing that my eternity is secure. There's a difference between happiness and true joy. And Solomon knew that. And he knows it. The heart knows its own bitterness. No outsider shares in its joy. Even in laughter, a heart may be sad and joy may end in grief. So even if there's laughter in someone's life, um, I mean, we've, we've seen example after example of comedians who are laughing at themselves and laughing at others and then end up taking their own lives. We've, we've seen that happen even in recent years uh, with well-known comedians. And, and what's the reason why there's not a true joy there? They were seeking after happiness that come from their own laughter, but everything may look good on the outside, but the inside was, was torn up. It was, it was not rooted and grounded in the wisdom of God. And so when following godly wisdom, there is a prudence that we can have, a discernment. There is contentment that can be found. There is joy that can be found. And now we can see that in following godly wisdom, there can be a thriving in our lives. A thriving. Let's look at 11 and 12 again. The, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. As we have already talked about, this is in that chiastic structure. I'll show, you, show it to you again. All of this has been feeding up to verses 11 and 12. And when we look at verses 11 and 12, there, there is a call to evaluate. And he's speaking to his son, but he's speaking to us as well. The Lord is. To evaluate where your foundation is. You can have everything look good on the outside, have a nice quote-unquote house, but if its foundation, as we look at 11, is not in the godly wisdom and in dependence upon the Lord, it will be destroyed. But you can have an outside that doesn't look so polished and fancy. It could be a tent. But as long as its foundation is in the Lord and godly wisdom, Solomon says you will flourish. You will thrive. Verse 12, there is a way that seems right to a person. A way that seems right to a person. But its end is the way of death. That's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty strong words there to use the word death. But we know that when one is depending on themselves, one is looking at themselves as the God of their own lives. As verse 12 says, Everything seems right to them because their way seems right to them. We think about Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The, the wages of living a life where you are the one who says what goes and what seems right or feels good to you, you just do that, that is sin, and ultimately it leads to death. Now sometimes what seems right to a person may lead to physical death, but ultimately what's being talked about here is a spiritual death, a separation in a, from a relationship with God that we were originally and in, in ultimately intended to be in. And so the central point of this section in Proverbs is here. We give, we're given attention to the difference between wisdom and foolishness regarding prudence, contentment, and joy. And wisdom and foolishness can now be compared in terms of outcomes. And the outcomes of the wise person is thriving in life, flourishing for eternity. And the outcome for the foolish one, the one that would do what seems right to them, is death. Is death. So, 
Each person chooses a path for his or her life. And without God, and without choosing godly wisdom in that path, people do not have the wisdom they need to make the best choices with their lives. And ultimately, it's a choice of life or death. So, how does your life so far, what is your life currently, if, if what we're doing, and I, I, I had this underlined here, if what we're doing, our words and our actions reveal the difference between wickedness and righteousness, following wisdom and following foolishness, lady wisdom versus lady folly. If our words and actions reveal which choice we're making, how is your life demonstrating which path you're on? And as you go, and that's a question for you, but also as you go to counsel and disciple those around you, what are their words and actions revealing about the path that they're on? It's usually pretty clear. I, I, I use this phrase, this phrase from the Scriptures, Luke chapter 6, all the time, but what comes out of the mouth is an overflow of the heart. You can find out really quickly from someone's words and their actions what's going on in their heart. And what's going on in their heart is the foundation in which they're living on. Is it themselves and their own desires, or is it a foundation in the wisdom of God? Verse 11 and 12 tell us, If it's a foundation in yourself, it will be destroyed. If it's a foundation in the Lord, you will flourish. Evaluate your own life. Consider your words, your actions, your thoughts. What path am I on? And as I go to evangelize, disciple, counsel others, what can I observe about what's going on with them to know where they are and what path they are on in order to help them? We want to make sure that our own relationship is right, but we want to be able to help others. That is the great commission that we've been given. And so we can then go to others, giving them the, God's wisdom in order to get them off the, the lady folly path and onto the godly wisdom that they, they need in order to make the right decisions for the now and eternity. Let me pray for you as we seek to be ones who are building our foundation, even though it may be a tent on the outside, but building our foundation on God's wisdom and God's wisdom alone. Let me pray for us. Father, we are grateful for your word and the reminder once again that there is a choice we have to make. Is it going to be a choice to, to follow after wickedness or follow after righteousness? Is it going to be a choice to follow after the folly of this world, or the wisdom of you and your word. Lord, grant us the, the ability and the dependence upon you that we need. And Father, help us as we seek to counsel and guide others onto this path of godly wisdom also. Lord, help us to do that now. Not waiting to sometime in the future, but help us to put an application this type of living now. And we know that it will only come by diving into your word. Give us a resolve to do that on a regular basis, on a daily basis. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this, this continued study through Proverbs. Hope to see you next time as we continue uh, next session in Proverbs as well. Thank you and God bless.